Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Drew. We've got another guest with us for session, I believe, number seven now. This is going to be Mr. Tu Yang. He is a uh, music teacher, vocal coach, and um, just kind of give us a brief explanation of your uh, musical education and history and your involvement. Sure thing. Um, me, I am uh, primarily a music teacher and um, choir, choir director, and uh, I went to I have my bachelor's and my master's degree in uh, choral conducting, and I sing a lot, uh, especially it was just within the last couple of years. It's been a, it's been a very interesting um, change in, in field. So I'm still teaching, but I'm, I feel like I've been performing a lot more than I have been teaching. <laughs> and a very, reason. a very experienced teacher and singer, and we're excited to have him with us today. So if you guys enjoyed this, once you get through, make sure you drop a like, throw some comments and subscriptions, and uh, we're getting ready to see what we can learn about Mr. Two. So without further ado, let's gonna let's gonna let's drop right into these traditional questions. So starting off really light, uh, what is your favorite or preferred drink? A drink, I would have to go with root beer. Root beer, that's a first. Yeah, root beer. Um, there was this root beer I had back in California. I believe it was the Thomas Kemper root beer. For some reason, I just really hit with that. You know, I, I like any kind of root beer when it comes down to it. But for some reason, Thomas Kemper really, really hit. And there's a Virgil's and a, a whole bunch of other beers that I just like to try. Thomas Kemper. Why do I feel like I've heard that name before? Yeah, and so I I don't know if it's if it's a local brand or or somewhere, but it was in Southern California. They had this entire wall of just root beer, cream sodas, and orange sodas. So Dad's root beer was on there, and a whole bunch of other types. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I remember I used to drink those like orange sodas out of the glass all the time, the glass mm-hmm. bottles. Um. Let's see, jumping into more music-ish questions. Um, so what or who got you into music, and how did you find out that you could sing? So I actually didn't start off as a singer. I um, I started off with a band, clarinet. Ooh. And um, this would have been sixth grade. Uh, my music teacher, uh, Bob Russell, who uh, passed away um, mm-hmm. many years ago At this, uh, by this point, um, remember distinctly all my friends got to leave to go to to this and teacher this music teacher and i'm like i'm over here sitting by myself you know, doing my work i'm like okay well band that's not for me i you know i love math and i love science so i'll stay with that computers yeah. that that was my thing yeah but um i noticed that all my friends were leaving every single time this and director i'm like well i guess they are i'm I'm the only one left you know, in the classroom. And so I feel kind of left out. And finally, mm-hmm. my friends convinced me next semester to join. So I did. And um, I got on the recorder and I played it. And for some reason, it just made sense. Everything made sense to me. And I just kept at it. I actually didn't start singing until, until high school. And even then, I wasn't in like any choir or anything. Yeah. Like a doo-wop group or a barbershop group. It, well, it was mostly doo-wop, actually. And um, we we just sang for fun and I had the most fun I've ever had. And it wasn't until college I got into, um, into choral music or any kind of, um, classical music. So you, uh, sang all throughout high school, but that's really where you found your voice. Yeah. And so, um, I remember distinctly, um, this would have been eighth, eighth grade over the summer. And my voice just dropped overnight. Like, um, it just, it was as high as it was higher than my sister's and all of a sudden it's it was the lowest in the family <laughs> and um it was a little scary because i used to be able to you know playing clarinet i used to be able to sing the scales with the clarinet just fine and then all of a sudden i found myself being able to kind of like sing with the, the you know the trombones and the, the baritones and the tubas and, the, and uh, stuff yeah tubas i mean um I remember that it was really hard for me to sing a note when, I, when my voice first changed uh, I didn't really quite feel that it was for me because everyone at the time in choir, see, there was like an SAB choir, and I heard them out the yeah. door, um, walking by, mm-hmm. and I would try to sing along a little bit, and I noticed like I couldn't keep up 
by any means. And so I just felt, okay, well, uh, choir is not for me because I can't even, I can't match pitch, right? I can't match what they're doing yeah, with yeah. what I felt. And that is, uh, it's a good place to start, man. I'll tell you, because I remember I didn't start like singing until probably when I hit high school. I mean, I was one of those kids where I thought I could sing in middle school <laughs> until I actually started exercising my voice. But yeah, so does so you said that you were the lowest in the family. So does does your voice not or like as far as like does it run in the family or? I think my really? my my older brother has a similar voice. My younger brother, <clears throat> then the my oldest uh, half brother, has has a pretty deep voice too. Uh, so it's think it it doesn't run in the family but you can tell until there's some nuances like okay this this guy has to be bit there, of a genetic somewhat... outlier right <laughs> right 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 and for, for me you know i don't i don't particularly particularly think i have like a really really deep voice i think it's more of a um because of my height and my size and just you know, seeing me for the first time you don't expect the voice and so it feels deeper than it really is <laughs> yeah, you know what i mean yeah, yeah for sure so, so so that's you you're leading me to think that you're potentially short is this correct or incorrect <laughs> i am five foot seven so five. that's which is actually probably i i think i'm the third tallest in the family third tallest yeah so we have a uh, five eight and five ten. Oh wow lord I, I that makes me feel tall and i'm not tall at all I'm only I'm only five foot eleven. Yeah, that's then you you'd be the tallest in in my entire family. So oh, you well you know I forgot I, I remember seeing some of those videos you did with Bobby and uh, the other gentleman. I remember Kelly, seeing yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's uh, Kelly is I believe he's almost an entire foot higher than uh, taller than I am. <laughs> so he, he's clocking in at about six 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 seven. That is pretty tall. Yeah, and so um, tall. I'm I'm about that, and uh, yeah. I'm a little bit closer to the camera, so you, you can give me a little <laughs> bit more, well, a couple more inches yeah, for yeah, those videos. <laughs> Nobody knows until you tell them, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, who are some of the most influential figures, both in your life as well as your musical career? I would say my, my choir director. So uh, both uh, Bob Russell, who was the band director for, for um, elementary. Then um, it wasn't until... Uh, I got into to college, so it would be um, my first my first choir director, and I still keep in touch with her. You know, she's retired now, and mm -hmm. I tell her everything we do. She knows everything that I that I've been doing, and uh, it's it's just so amazing because um, how she got me was she sent um, some sort of it was actually my friend, but she it was like uh, I was cornered by my friend because I you know, I wasn't in choir at the time and. He just came up to me and said, hey, need a bass in chamber choir. You're going to audition today. <laughs> and so that was my audition. And I go in and my choir director is there. And do you play some scales? And I sang for her. And she said, OK, well, you are definitely in. And let's see what happens. And it's been like that ever since. That's pretty cool. That's going into part of the next question um what is something that one of those influential figures so i guess her in this case what what is something she has said to you that stuck with you your entire journey through life one one uh, particular quote from her and I, i'll always remember this is we were in doing a rehearsal and she said she, she stopped everyone and this is toward the end of class she said just remember that the gift that god has given you how you use it is your gift back to to God, mm -hmm. and uh, for, for me that's always stuck with me because you know I thought, well you know I'm just, I'll just do. At the time I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, well maybe maybe I can do computer science or maybe I'll I'll just stay with radio because I, I was in radio at the time. Mm -hmm. Then uh, after she said that, I thought, well you know I, I know, I know music. And I really like it. I don't think I've ever lost any passion for music, and yeah, you know, ever since I started. Right. So uh, from there, it, it was that very specific quote. And until this day, I still think, okay, when I'm performing, this is not just for me and not just for the audience, but this is you know, this is my gift. This is yeah. what, how I'm using it. 
Definitely. And it's it's kind of like Steve Harvey said, too. There's a video I remember watching one day where he said something along the lines of he created everyone with a specific gift. And if and what is something that you can do that you can uh, I think he said, what is something you can do? Can you make ten dollars with this gift or something? It was like this video about how to how to become a millionaire or something like that. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And I was I remember hearing him say that. And I was like, that's immediately where my mind popped to when you said that. I was like, he's definitely he definitely said that. So yeah. definitely some words to live by people. If you haven't found your gift yet. Token of uh, a little nugget of advice. It'll come. <laughs> if you don't know yet, it will come. That's um, so true. I think I was, I was about twenty at the time. So, <laughs> I remember I was I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and not long ago. And ever since I picked up this YouTube this channel, it's been just been completely obvious that this is where I'm supposed to be. That's so, amazing, and and I'm really enjoying your videos too. By the way, some good, <laughs> great stuff there. Awesome. Good job. I, it's it's awesome to know that I got some people like you watching. That's pretty awesome. I enjoy yours as well, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, the music teacher esque uh, reaction type stuff is something that I like to uh, like to catch myself watching on occasion, whenever I'm not doing anything else. Because even I learn stuff. I mean, I I feel like I know something, but every time I go listen to one of yours or one of someone else's, I just there's more, more little nuggets of knowledge. That's so true. And you know, when I listen to to your video or Peter's or who. Ever and I, I try I try to watch it after I put out a video and then I'm like oh you know let's let me see what let, let's see what these other guys have to say about it it's like oh I didn't didn't even think of that or it's like wow you know you're right this this is uh, some this is something that that I missed yeah. I kind of the spur of the moment when it comes to to music mm -hmm. which is what I feel maybe that's why I'm so drawn to jazz it's like it's just oh, jazz is just a vibe uh, yeah jazz vibe the the vibe is just so amazing and the the improvisation on the spot ready to go you say something and i'll say something back to you and we'll have a conversation it's it's so like authentic it really uh, is it's really got that touch to it mm -hmm. so um do you happen to play any instruments so you have a piano i've i've seen it in some of in several of your videos but um do you have do you play any other instruments or anything so um i, I I know you mentioned play clarinet. Yeah, I was gonna say you uh, mentioned that. Cla clarinet. Um, so clarinet, piano, voice mainly, and then um, really just general. Generally, being a music teacher, generally most of the instruments, I will stay away from string instruments just because I know that I don't have, <laughs> I don't have, I definitely don't have the technique uh, <laughs> yeah. at all, and. Um, there was one instrument that that I I remember my my teacher said maybe you should stick with this other instrument instead. I think that was <laughs> that that might have been a French horn. I believe that's what it was. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. a tough and one. So, that is a tough one. So um, I am humbled by all anyone who plays French horn. It's just such a beautiful instrument. It really is. Um, it it requires a very specific type of person to play. Definitely. So you played the primarily the clarinet. You played the clarinet what the longest I believe, and then you picked up piano after. Is that right? Yeah, and so um, I picked up piano just uh, by ear on the, along the way. Um, clarinet I played um, throughout the elementary, elementary, middle school, and high school, and parts of college. And then right around college is when I really got into choir and classical opera. Gotcha, gotcha. How long you've have you long have you been playing? clarinet now ever since you picked it up so um i actually stopped once i changed which i switched over okay so um, that would have been only let me see say only about eight or nine years eight or nine more years than a lot of most people though <laughs> yeah i i will say that i am i, I was not not a um, proficient player I, I knew my my stuff and i think i i sounded pretty good but I was definitely not at the level that my peers were, and that they they were just so amazing. I was thinking, you know, I don't know if I can keep up with a clarinet <laughs> like this. Yeah, it's it's a tough instrument. I know, a, and I have a friend of mine that uh, played it in high school, and as far as I know, she still plays it every once in a while. She's gone into music ed herself also, 
and she just she still has hers and plays it on occasion. I'm like, that is just too unique of an instrument for me. I can't make woodwinds work. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I had to stick to brass, but I loved it. I love the instruments, man. Um, so you've had the piano, the clarinet. Let's see. Um, what are some things that people, most people, may not know about you, given your like your internet life and such? Oh well, um, for me, um, well, teaching music, um, do some. Uh, well, you know, with this, I do some recording. I used to do um, some uh, field recording, so um, like uh, orchestral, uh, choral recordings for for colleges, some sort. And so, um, that's that's part of it. And I do a little bit of a little bit of programming. I get back into computer science just for fun. Uh, my son and I, we've, he's shown an interest in, in that. And so I've been working on that as well with him, alongside with him. How old is your son? He's 10. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, I am a, a married and a father of five. So I have f- five kids. Five kids? Yes. And that's five awesome. kids. And so for, for me to be able to do these videos without any uh, distractions is a or you know is a little, blessing <laughs> yeah mini tasmanian devils running around you know <laughs> oh yeah so some of my videos if you listen really closely you can actually hear the foot stomps and you can hear the background noise i try to use a, a filter on and uh some noise removal stuff but there's only so much of that I can do right <laughs> right right yeah when do you when do you find time to do the videos I usually do them either early in the morning or late at night so um, most of the times, sometimes I can get them in uh, pretty early in the morning, but usually the afternoon or nighttime. I got you. I got you. I was just saying um, that probably seems like it would be the best time given given the like the age range of the kids. How old was your oldest? Ten. Oldest is twelve. Twelve. Gotcha. 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 And how old was your uh, youngest? Three. Three. That's mm-hmm. cool, man. She just got through the terrible twos. <laughs> pretty much i feel like uh i feel like those those terrible twos uh last on for a lot longer than just just a year <laughs> yeah that's that's what i've heard <laughs> uh, you know and, and at the same time you know they're they're such a blessing and it's just it's like you kind of miss that age too like oh you know i remember when you needed me for everything now you don't need me for for this it's like well let, let me help you <laughs> you know let me right, stay, let me yeah. let me keep on helping you even though you're you're like 27 now. <laughs> yeah, so you're you've got you've got five kids. You used to do the uh, recordings for orchestras. Is there any other things that uh, stick out that people might not know about you? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm I'm, I'm pretty simple. I, m- music is <laughs> music is is pretty much my life. Um, yeah. If it's if it's not with recording, then it's uh, computers in general. Um, I I also do some. Um, our time AV like computer stuff, just hmm. overall whoever somebody like a, a church or something will call someone will call me. Yeah, uh, can you come check out my computer or check out my audio, my video system? And so I'll go and I'll do that. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so technically, I, it's still musically. There. <laughs> In a way, I guess you can say. In a say. way, yeah. What's um so primarily your your main method of income. So like what you do for a living is being just this music teacher. Yes. Yes. So music teacher. And then, uh, ever ever since, um, ever since COVID, uh, it's been, and you know, as the restrictions were, were lifted, it's been, um, a blessing to be able to perform, um, just as much. Yeah, definitely. Which has been pretty nice. Yeah. So where are you, um, where are you, uh, primarily a teacher at? Um, this would be uh, here in uh, here in town, Kansas City. Okay, gotcha, Kansas mm-hmm. City. That's yeah, pretty Kansas cool. Kansas City. That's pretty awesome. Uh, and so, um, I'm also doing private voice, and it's it's a big load, but it it works. It works really well. It keeps you afloat, right? It does yep. Um, what do you do in your off time when you're not singing, recording, performing, fixing things, etc.? Well, just yeah, with my family. That's about all i can do <laughs> yeah yeah so I'm, you, I'm with them do you like to travel I do uh, i do um i typically um it's fortunately i can't travel with my family but i i usually travel once or twice a month 
which has been which is pretty nice and that's it's pretty typical i mean i travel a lot more when it's performance season mm -hmm. in terms of like uh leisure traveling like we try to do my, my wife and i we try to do, to do something once a year with the kids yeah yeah so what's for the most a, part i'm yeah, go ahead i was just say what's a what's a popular vacation spot for y'all for us i think um what, what was that we went down to alabama it was um dolphine dolphine beach dolphine beach I've heard yeah. of that. I've just, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the uh, Alabama, but I've definitely heard of Delphine. Uh, so it's like, so right there. I think uh, Florida is like an hour or two away only. Hmm. So um, that that one was pretty fun. We haven't gone back yet, but I, I think that that might be in the works soon again. Kansas City is, isn't isn't that though? Isn't that in Missouri? Yeah, Missouri. Yep, yeah. Missouri. We it's like Kansas City is always like trying to. Kansas City and St. Louis. The joke is, is that it's always trying to get out of Missouri, <laughs> <laughs> and so. But I, I'm 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 on the Missouri side of I, Kansas City. I wish that I could say I've been there, but the only the closest I've ever been. My dad went on a business trip, and we decided to go with him to keep him company, and you know, just to help him feel good about going. So he went. He had to go up to Springfield, Illinois, for a business trip, yeah. and he had to. Uh, I guess get some training on some equipment because he's an engineer for a local news channel down here where I live. Wow. And um, we went with him and I remember we were, it was like day five. We're getting ready to head back and we're getting ready to catch our plane. And we go to Springfield and our flight gets canceled. And I'm like, great it's traditional. So we managed to find one rental car and then we had to drive two hours South from Springfield to St. Louis it's, and we hopped on our flight there, and then we pretty, it, everything else worked itself out. But I remember I wanted my visit to St. Louis to be a little bit more elongated than it was, <laughs> considering we were just going there to fly. But well, definitely, yeah. Uh, I haven't been. I haven't been to I Illinois. Um, I think to stop in Chicago, but um, in terms of actually doing something in that state uh, not not yet it's uh it's interesting if you ever get to go it's an interesting place all kinds of people there <laughs> my, bro my brother does live in chicago so um that oh, might wow. be uh that might be a, a visit might be a visit uh, that i'll need to do <laughs> yeah definitely definitely so um back towards music a little bit um how sure. often do you practice throughout the week like singing and how long do you typically practice for for me i try to i'm usually they're working on sight reading so I, I do a lot of theory and a lot of sight reading and ear training um mm. before i even start singing yeah and um part, part of that is because i i i'm a firm believer of of just uh, of this concept called uh, audiation meaning that hearing something and then applying it to to your voice like for example, if you were to if you were to think of a song, that's just for example, um, at the tiger, right? You can hear the introduction, you can hear at um, the guitar, you can hear the the crescendo, the crescendo of the um, the guitar, and then the mm -hmm. yeah, the intensity and the rhythm. And I can, as we're talking right now, we can all hear that music, right? If you know the song, you can hear it played in your head. <laughs> Boom. And, um, <laughs> for me, cool. like for me, for me, whenever I'm playing practicing on the piano or just playing scales actually not singing just yet because the voice is already activating itself and then That's from there I cool and then from there then i finally uh, i do breathing exercises like i'll, I'll breathe through uh sing through a straw um some sovt exercises so semi occluded semi occluded vocal tract and um yeah. just going going through those um and I, I'll start applying like in layers. Uh, I'll, I'll do some some vowels just on a hum. Um, nothing nothing too too big yet. And mm -hmm. uh, more breathing exercises and opening up to to certain vowels. Working on some resonances. And this is typically the theory portion will probably be about fifteen twenty minutes, and then the actual singing will be in like another the fifteen or twenty. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if I'm if I want to fully warm up, then I, I would go a little bit further. But uh, for the most part, I think that's that's like my golden golden area. 
golden ticket. I see. Yeah. So you typically right around 45-ish minutes before you get around to singing. Ish. Uh, right, right around there. And so I, I don't touch any repertoire. Um, I'm seeing any repertoire because I, I, what, what I try to do is I try to commit to memory um, just, uh, intervals, um, skips, uh, really, really odd changes, dynamics. So just phrases that, that I wouldn't normally use in music uh, that I, the music that I typically sing. Mm -hmm. So that way, when I, when I encounter it in, in other music, whether it's um, jazz or classical, or even the rock Modernoff, you know, like, yeah, I, right, sorry, I'm, I'm, I have the book right here. <laughs> and so, um, I do that and I just try to associate myself with like the actual instrument before I get into, to the repertoire. I got gotcha. you. So that at, at least to me, it mentally prepares me so that when I do get in, into the rep, I'm not worried about notes. Like I can, I can just pick it up and sight read it and sight read it with dynamics or sight read it with intention of the piece and look at the words and pay pay attention to the words as opposed to trying to commit to memory oh, okay here's this weird jump again it's like oh no i i know this jump yes yeah. that's, that's how it's written yeah yeah i got you so yeah. that's it's about just shy of an hour for practicing and warming up before you go into singing Interesting. and so it it's 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 intense uh, for the most part <clears throat> vocally i'd say pretty much around 20 to 25 minutes in terms of actual vocal before I sing something. Um, uh, the theory part is so important for me because that's, I, I've noticed that's how my brain works. Mm -hmm. for the most part when you, and when you got it running through your head before you're even singing, it's also, it's, it's a pretty interesting feeling I, I've noticed. Like it, the way you described it, it's like, I, I have that happen to me all the time, but I just didn't know how to put it into words. But I was like, now that you've mentioned it, that that'll be daggone. Yeah, and uh, there's there's so much to be said about committing committing things to memory, and then um, being able to shape that memory in in a different format. So, like we all know, we all know the Rachmaninoff, and we hear it all the time. And then you know, I get to work with all these different directors that direct it differently, and these different ensembles. And so I have to be ready to shape my sound a certain way and to blend with the, the ensemble because every performance is not the same right so exactly it's definitely a lot of fun yeah definitely um so um you kind of gave us an idea of what your warm up, warm up routine looks like mm -hmm. excuse me um and do you happen to have a go-to warm-up exercise i know you mentioned you do the hmms and the open up to the vowels are there any other mm -hmm. warm-ups actually exercises that come to mind that you like um yeah so the the straw uh the hmm sound the h n g so the mm, like those those kind of sounds mm -hmm. or it's where the mouth is open but the ng closes everything off mm. and it just gives you just allows you to build that resonance and um mm. to me I, I really like that especially for especially for subharmonics which is what I try to balance, what what, what I've, I've been trying to balance for like the last many years now since I've been doing it, since so, um yeah yeah, say fourteen years I think almost <laughs> for for me and that uh, I know there are, there are people out there that have been doing it way longer than I have. For me, I just I've noticed that the the ng really helps me just bring it together and blend blend it in such a way that it at least feels more like it's like it's appropriate for what I do. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. That's, I'll have to incorporate that in some of my uh, music at a later date. Some of those uh, warm ups. I've been taking in a lot of info throughout these interviews and podcasts and such through like nice. warm ups and such. And I, I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. this warm up is great. This warm up mm. sucks. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, it's helping me a lot. I think, mm. um, so uh what are some of your record high and low chest notes and then that's a two-part question so some of your record highs and what's your daily usable yeah so for, for me my record high would be about a g4 and we're talking about record right we're not talking about right yeah. great sounding <laughs> so I, I i tend not to in terms of just like best i think i i've gotten up to about a g um, mixed, I can go a little bit higher. I n try not to stay up there too too long. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, I've always been like, you know, for, from the high parts of my voice, like, well, if it's not an F4, I'm not really comfortable going above that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, daily would be would be about E4, F4 that that I'm comfortable with. Yeah. Forming. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, and um, daily lows, I'm probably about usually about B B flat. I was gonna say um, that sounds like about where your uh, tessitura lies. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm usually about there. Um, in terms of resonating a little bit more, I say my I, I would prefer my C two or D two, a little bit that. Um, record low would probably be about an. I don't remember, I think it was. This would have been a long, long time ago. I haven't checked, but record low would would have been about an F one. <laughs> and so, that's cool. Then uh, mo most mornings, most mornings would be I'm I'm usually at about G or A flat one. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So you you end up losing those you a bottom out daily pretty much right around that B flat B issue. Uh, and and uh, bottom out it's I think it's more of me just just um okay where am I in my voice how how have I been using it uh, I've been trying something just like just within like the past year trying to to get a better blend of the so-called the, the chest fry mm -hmm. and I, i've noticed you know i've been singing this a, a little weird um <laughs> lately why don't i try this and um i think one morning i got got down to like a, a d1 <laughs> and al almost the c1 and it, it was um I'll, I'll have to send you a clip uh op, uh off the record yeah, yeah. and uh, it, it was a lot of fun it was like wow this actually felt really connected and for, but for the most part i think um bottoming out uh, up it'll probably be about a flat would yeah, be my, okay, if, if i if i were to just you know wake up in the morning and sing a note i knew that I, I would know that a flat in g1 is would be where it is um sometimes however at night after a long day um, the low range comes back too yeah that so uh, could, evening it, voice right yeah evening voice so it can be it, it's kind of like a roulette sometimes <laughs> with those with those super low notes yeah 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 man i'm jealous <laughs> uh i've i'm always i've i've got this tag in my discord it's called wannabe bass singer and i oh. <laughs> i wish i could assign it to myself a hundred times over because that's that just describes me perfectly um so let's see so your daily range is in there um moving on to some artist related questions so who are some of your first personal favorite artists and are there any that you've collaborated with on any projects um, i am a little bit uh biased when it comes to this and i'm not <laughs> tooting my own horn by any means it's just it, it, it's been an honor to just be able to sing with them but um both of them would be Eric Alatori and uh, Glenn Miller. Um, That's just, awesome. Yeah, so the, these guys are were just, in I remember um, being in my, my first first couple of weeks in choir in college with my choir director. Yeah, and she plays this piece from Chanticleer. I believe it was um it was Silent Night by Gene Perling, and uh, Chanticleer was uh, saying it. Mm -hmm. And he just sings a low B flat at the very end. I'm thinking, is he doing this? Like I am struggling on a B flat, <laughs> and mm -hmm. here he is just ringing it out, like and, like he's carrying it across the entire choir. Uh, yeah, and it was just surreal. And what, actually, I got to to sing with him uh, this past this past summer uh, with a uh, with a, the the group Skylark. And uh, I told him that story, and he's like, "Yeah, that's uh, what. What am I? This is such. Uh, he, in which it was Chanticleer was was a really big part of his uh, of his his career. Yeah, yeah. As you can tell, of course, you know yeah, he was course, yeah he was the bass, and um, you know, I was just being able to to sing with him, talk with him. It was uh, amazing in itself. It's the same with uh, Glenn. Same with Glenn Miller. You know, he's such." a kind kind person to, to talk talk to and a very very supportive 
and um really funny too um uh, his his jokes are like they they go sometimes they go unnoticed you have to be really like in tune it's like <laughs> oh, okay he made a joke and it's actually pretty funny and i i get it <laughs> and so um it's a so delayed it's, reaction joke is what i call uh, it and I, I sometimes i feel like wait did i know that that must have been a joke because <laughs> i have to calc I have all these calculations going it's like is this yeah <laughs> that's awesome um, being able to to sing uh, next with him it, it's it, it has been uh, a privilege for me so just uh, that that collaboration um, will always be be like a memorable experience what is it like being able to stand beside someone that can sing and project that low of a chest range it is um it's actually very comforting if that makes sense <laughs> comforting it's like wow Oh, I'm over here having to check myself. Okay, uh, is today today is working pretty well. Here's my low range. I've sung this long. It's been 50 minutes, and here's my high range. This is my capacity, and I can do a C. No, I need to blend. I need to blend here, so I'll switch to subharmonics, and that way I can blend with the choir. Yeah, he's over here. A flat one, <laughs> flat one, E flat one, C two, C two, C two, C two, <laughs> and so it's like. <laughs> I don't have to worry anymore. I can just, I can just lean on. I can just carry, let him carry me. You know. Yeah, like just let him be the underlying foundation, right? Yeah, and and it's 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 so comforting to to know that it's like wow, I'm not just in this by myself. And not only that, like he is really just developing the choir when he sings. And so when I when I do get to to sing, sing something with him, and when we are on the same note. I'm not thinking about volume at all. I'm just thinking about, okay, how can can I be a part of this experience? How can I make it better for the audience? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's it, it's truly a humbling experience too. I think I've been next to a, some deep voices before, but I've never had the privilege to stand beside beside somebody that has truly that monstrous of a voice, and mm. at least in a low range, and. It's cool to hear about it because, you know, you have people that don't get to experience bass voices on a regular basis, especially ones that are freakishly low like Glenn and the other gentleman. Right. right. Yeah. Both, both Glenn and Eric, they really just, what I like about uh, about their voice specifically is that it's, they they set up. They are, they are very intentional with it with their sound it's not always here is a b flat one as loud as i can it's it's always within the integrity of the piece right yeah um we did a recording last year and uh, there, there was a b flat there was a b flat one uh jason jason toms who is also an amazing octavist was on that recording mm -hmm. and uh so this would have been this is like a long night we were all tired and Glenn comes in and he still has a B flat one, <laughs> just as strong as it was from the very beginning. And uh, I remember him saying, it's like, he, he turned, turned to me and he said, you know, don't, don't worry, don't worry about the B flat one. I'll take care of it. <laughs> like, Glenn, you, you do not understand how thankful I am right now. <laughs> and, right? you know, and it's not to say that I, you know, I was putting on sound, but I realized that, okay, I'm losing, I was losing some of that low end. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's like, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. And they just walk, yeah. you know, he goes for it. It's like, okay, well, here I am. I'm just, I'll float, I'll just float the boat and just let you do your thing. Just casually drop a B flat one like it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it, it's surreal. And at the same time, like, um, in, in the choir actually sounds very different. You almost, you, you can hear him, but not next to you, if that makes sense. Yeah. He's actually in the room. It's as if he is in the yeah, room, yeah. singing to you, and like that to me, like that. I always tell my students: if you hear too much of yourself right next to you, probably not projecting enough outside of you. And uh, for, for Glenn, it's like, wow, you know, I I can hear him in the room, and even though he's standing next to me. I can hear him in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you can. His voice carries that much, man. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Um, let's see. Who are some people that you would like to collaborate with in the future? Oh, for, for me, uh, I would have to say, I am, 
<clears throat> I I love co collaborating in person. That's just my thing. I I know it's 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 been hard with with all with all the restrictions, everything. Mm -hmm. So and just being careful, obviously. Yeah. But um, I would say, person that I would like, I would love to be able to meet, in person, just to be able to sing with, I would say would be uh, Eric Holloway. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and so um he he is um he's always an, an inspiration and um seeing his videos just his musicality his approach to, um, to voice acting as well it's just so so amazing and so he's i would love to be able to just you know, maybe that's what i need to do is just say hey um one of these choir directors you need to have this guy on board if you want me to sing as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I, I probably won't do, I probably won't do, um, hold them to that, but I, I would love to have, um, Eric be a part of, uh, of this other scene of music with, um, with activism. That um, would be, that would be fun to listen to. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to get a hold of him to get him on here on the YouTube channel. And I've, it's proven unsuccessful at this point in time, but I'm hoping to have him on at some point in the future. He's a he's a busy busy guy. Busy guy. Ever, ever since he blew up with that voice of his, he's he seems to have been really hitting his stride. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, once in a while, I'll try to reach out to him. But I I do know I do understand that he's uh has a lot uh, a lot going on. Yeah. So. <laughs> he's a he's a character though. From what I've been told, there ain't no one else in the world like him. Oh yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. Do you have any tips, tricks, or life hacks for anyone that sings, wants to sing, or is trying to make a career out of singing? Uh, um, for for me, I always am a firm believer that if that you are able to produce any kind of sound, that you you should be, and if you're willing to, you can exercise that and build that sound. It's kind of like um, I'm I'm a huge fan of pro you know, computer programming it, everything starts with zeros and ones you have to start somewhere yeah and maybe yeah. you start off with a zero eventually you add one and then you go the two bits you know zero 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 one zero one one and then three <laughs> and then you keep going right yeah yeah and uh music i had a couple of students that said you know i i, I love to sing but i i just i need some help how how can i get get into this i i I can't match pitch. And then I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. You can't match pitch or that, that you just haven't been able to find the correct exercise to allow that come together. Your right. ears, what yeah. you hear and what you can sing. So um, <clears throat> my, 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 my tip or a hack is, is to not forget about your experience that you've built in your voice the language that you've learned, the dynamics and the speech that you have, incorporate all of that because that's where your emotions also lie. I mean that if you, if you speak a different language or if you speak more than one language or if you have an accent or if you don't have an accent or whatever it is that it may be, incorporate that into your music. Don't, don't remove that when you see notes on the page. Because that's the very thing that musicians, that's the very thing that we try to do is to not just play the notes that are on the page, mm -hmm. not just sing the notes that are on the page. Yeah. And you, when you come in with, with the mentality of, and you do have something to contribute, then you do have experience. You just need the training and the, the coaching and the shaping of your sound. And, you know, you have a higher chance of being successful in all that you do. Just making sure you're trained, making sure you have experience. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I my voice changed, even though I was speaking around E2 and D2, you know, or even F2, wherever it was, I couldn't sing. I couldn't sing below a C3. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sing above a C3. I had one note when my voice changed because that's just, that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. That's really, it's really common. If, if I were to base myself off of that one instance of not being able to match pitch, not being able to sing with my, with my peers, which I actually did. And that's what kept me from singing for so long. You know, what would have happened if I just never went back to choir? 
right yeah if, gave I, it if I stayed song. well i couldn't match pitch in eighth grade because my voice changed and it's probably not for me because i can't sing high oh so, and i wouldn't be where i am today it, it's it's like a saying i think it may have been my grandfather that said um he said it ain't worth having if you ain't willing to put in the effort I so think, true. I think, and something else. Basically, what he's saying, at least one of the things he's saying, guys, is to if you've if you can make noise with your voice, give it a shot. You can learn a lot, and you'd be surprised how far you can go with your voice. You'd be surprised what you can learn about your own voice if you just experiment with it you do something with it if you can only sing a c3 like he said then just work on it work with it Mm -hmm. get someone that like him or a music teacher and vocal coach someone that knows more about it and just work with them you would be surprised and it's kind of like it's it's similar to an experience i had ever since i joined the bass nation is i've been rediscovering i guess you could say uh, my voice ever since I joined and I joined with absolute uh, like my confidence in my voice was bottoming out like I was wanting to do a project and I have this nice mic I have my moving blanket studio over here to the right and I'm just not I'm just sitting here I don't I don't have the faith in, my, in myself to put out music because I'll go I'll record and then I'll I'll bring it over to the computer and I'm like I don't like the way that sounds but the beautiful thing is, too, is like these people that I've met, these coaches, these people that know so much about the voice and music and such, like getting a second set of ears to listen to it and someone else that tells you that you actually don't sound bad. You just need to work or you need to train it some more, need to work with it some more. It's truly humbling to know that it, it revitalized my confidence. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 a beautiful thing too, guys. So, like I said, if if I if anyone has heard any of my music yet or has any ever heard me sing, you will know that I have very poor. I still have very poor self confidence, but I've gotten to where I can actually sing for people now, and actually f- feel better about it. Like at one point, I got to where I would send a recording off, and then I would want to delete it. Like I'd be like, Ugh. but long story short, yeah, that's that's what he's saying is if 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 you got someone like me whose confidence in your own voice just bottoms out, send it. <laughs> just just send it. Give there's you have nothing to lose. You'd be surprised where you're. So uh, you'd be surprised where a little work and a little training would get you. Um, let's see. Next question on here. Let's see. So uh, we sort of kind of know the answer to this, but I'm going to uh, lay it out on the table anyway. Uh, sure, sure. What are some of your what are your thoughts on extended techniques in singing in a choral setting, just in, in the in the vocal setting as a singer? I think for for me, if you have uh, an extended, <laughs> extended technique that is viable for the ensemble for the piece and it is performed in a in a healthy manner in that it's not just it's not something that's going to cost to you voice and by all means uh, please use it and this this goes for even um our technique if you are trying to approach uh the uh, solo you are going for a certain sound you're in what we would call normal voice chest voice you're also straining. I would even advise. I would advise against that. Yeah, even the normal singing, because you are no longer operating uh, with with a with the concept of health or longevity. Yeah. You're ru- you're 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 going to ruin your voice if you keep singing that way. Even <clears throat> I've seen some people in choirs like they they focus so much on blending, so they're always singing off the voice, off the voice. And we're talking about like big dramatic dramatic type voices like a dramatic mezzo Mm -hmm. or a dramatic tenor that's having to sing off the voice the fit bill of the the needs of the the choir yeah what ends up happening is that they're actually hurting their voice even though they're in their so-called mixed or their uh full voice they're actually hurting themselves by singing singing improperly so um yeah yeah and so the 
extended techniques follow the same format. Uh, I don't I don't think we should be partial to it in, by any means. Um, we do need to realize that there's a place and a time for it. And, uh, um, you probably don't want any whistle tones in, in choir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you probably don't want any whistle tones in opera. You definitely don't want um, any the you know, extended techniques and um, you are singing opera because that it's not going to carry the same way. It won't carry the same re uh, weight for the character because the, the character doesn't, the character to, has to have its own, its own, um, its own voice when you're singing. So for <clears> it to be, for you to introduce an extended technique that destroys this, the idea of bel canto, you know, this continuous line, this beautiful line, mm -hmm. Um, that's so important in, in opera. Um, you're, you're also breaking character, so mm -hmm. it's not going to work. You, you can't use the extended technique. Now, if you are doing um, the, that handle piece, what is it? The Fra Lombre. Um, it's the one where he sings really, really. I, I'd have to look it up again, but it's um, of one, the, the one with the Cyclops where he sings down to like a low low C sharp two and have to go has to go up to like a high G sharp four mm -hmm. something like that yeah and um yeah the 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 idea of that piece specifically is you have character who is full minded so he has he has a lower voice and he has an upper voice so for you to incorporate the, there are some some <clears throat> Performances that actually do do this, where you have this low bass singing, and then they go into their head register. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's almost like it's a different character whenever it's up really high. Yeah, that's actually appropriate. It's actually very appropriate to do it like that. Even though asses would say, "Oh no, you need to stay in your full voice the entire time." This specific character has two mentalities, has two personalities. Mm -hmm. So it would even be appropriate if you wanted to use an extended technique. The lower notes then be for the higher notes be have it be the full voice so let's say for example a tenor let's say a tenor who knew so harmonics wanted to approach this aria they could because that's the idea is is that this this cyclops has two different personalities and so which one which one do you bring to light right yeah so that, but that that's a whole different thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, about extended techniques. So you use subharmonics. Are there any others that you know about or use yourself? Um, I've actually met quite a few people on uh, in my performing journey. Um, there's for those who use um, strobas. There are those who use um, a variation of a throat singing, where it sounds a little bit, just a little bit more rough. Um, those who have would relate to as closer to VVM, so the false fold phonation, mm -hmm. where it's more false fold dominant or active, false fold active. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of them, not a lot used what what I what I use, and I think it's because it's just it can be very unstable. Mm -hmm. but it's also if you can stabilize it, then it can be like very easy to transition into. That's the that's the difference, but the pay, but the the um, what do you call that? Danger is is that it's a very fine line. Not a lot of not a lot of people depend on on the subharmonics that I use for live performance, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's been pretty interesting. So I, I've I've met uh, quite a few people that that use that use that. They get down to like about a C two. They use it like for about C two, and so when they hear when they hear me. Way down to like an F one or G one, they're like, "This is, what is that is that vocal fry? Is that your full voice?" It's like, "No, this is this is subharmonics." Yeah, yeah. They're like really? Like I can't even get can't get down to that that lower area, and it, it's because it's it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we can argue that that all the same is it's all vocal fry. It's all just a, a variation of of something. At the same time, we think those of you that those of us that are listening to those these specific techniques we can hear the the differences mm -hmm. between yeah. between vvm between subharmonics <clears throat> yeah yeah what are your thoughts on um uh ingressive phonation also known as inhale i, I find it very therapeutic personally and i i've been using it uh, quite a bit for 
to to regulate the the um the back pressure when we talk the, the thing about vocal um a little bit of vocal science is that when we're singing we have the uh, subglottal pressure which is the pressure from below mm -hmm. opening the vocal folds and very rarely do we talk about the supraglottal pressure which is the pressure on top it also allows the voice to flow and um i, I talked with um with a one of the one of the um let's see one of the voice i guess you can call it her voice doctor and in a, in a sense she has her doctorates and um in vocal pedagogy and everything mm -hmm. and um she showed a picture of, of the vocal folds they they don't just do this right because we're used to seeing the vocal folds uh, in um this position where it's like kind of moving like this right mm -hmm. yeah but if you flip it this way vocal folds actually open up like this yeah 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 you know, we, we don't really think about that. We're thinking, okay, it's just moving back and forth, but it's actually opening up. And in order, order for it to open up, it has to be the the pressure has to be to be regulated from both sides. Yeah. And all of that is to say is that for ingressive phonation, we remove the requirement for the supraglottal. Now we just focus on the subglottal. That's cool. I didn't know that. And so what that what that what that activates and what that allows us to activate that it allows us to reach really, really extreme ranges because we no longer have the requirement of having to dampen the top of the vocal folds. And so that's why you, you may hear singers where they, they have, they, maybe they're tenors or baritones or even basses, and all of a sudden they can inhale like a B0. Mm -hmm. uh, not just like a B0 vocal fry or B0 subharmonic, like a really, really loud B0. Yeah, yeah. And so my, my thoughts are is that that ingressive phonation removes that that requirement of the supraglottal um pressure that's needed mm -hmm. and uh you know beatboxers they use it all the time they do it because they have to, they have sometimes they do circular breathing or they have to breathe in and still create a bass mm -hmm. or um they they want really really low bass and the one way to activate that is to to breathe in to, to ingress yeah 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 and it would work out for them well too in the end because you're still phonating but you're breathing in at the same time Pretty, and, um, pretty helpful. And ingressive phonation actually is also very effective for really, really high notes. So whistle tones, if you if you can't do it normally, some people can do it ingressively because, like I said, the requirement of the, the pressure is different. Mm -hmm. Some people can do it, some people can't. For me, I can't do up high, but I can definitely do down low. Yeah, yeah, me too. It is, it is my preferred extended technique of choice. I, I definitely have some subs here and there, but it's very hit or miss. I have to get up with you later on working on those. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I will say with ingressive phonation, uh, there is, in my personal just around with things, I have noticed that there is a, your vocal folds, you're breathing in for, for ingressive or when trying to activate it for for the aggressive note, there is a state of which your folds are really thick, and that allows you to get to to those super low notes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to call that um, just you know thick like a, a thicker vocal fold setting, that's fine. And there is a state of which you can be in a detached mode and a thinner fold setting. It sounds more of like a, a gasp, as opposed to like um, as opposed yeah. to like a rattle. Yeah. For yeah. example. <gasps> Yeah. yeah and i've noticed that i can take that down all the way down to like a d2 about e2 yeah 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 uh, and um i've noticed and you can go once you get there however it'll break mm -hmm. and i've noticed that it breaks right around the same point which um the scientists have discovered or have kind of labeled right around D2 is when our ears and when our, where our voice starts to recognize like the actual pulses and actually recognizes that voice being in a, a mode of vocal fry phonation. That's like the interesting. Pulse phonation. And that's also right around where my voice completely cuts out. Like I can't, I can, I can't stretch it past that. And if I do, it automatically becomes, um, it be, it be, the vocal folds get really thick, like it almost like it breaks, it, become, it has to become thicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
research that a little bit more and we'll we'll get back to that but on a different time <laughs> it's it's a pretty cool little uh way to describe that uh that little area and transition from the gas blight to the thicker part of the in inhale so that's pretty cool passaggio is a that that's pretty much what a passaggio is is the, the handoff between the thickness of the folds to a thinner state or a or a state in between those where your <clears throat> thyroid or retinoids and your hypothyroids have to give way so they're always working together but which one is dominance now which one has dominance later or which one is is a part of this and which one is completely in and which one is completely out for the most part they're always even if it's one percent they're always working together yeah definitely definitely um let's see so this question is not immediately obvious to me but i so i'm gonna ask it uh, do you happen to have perfect pitch? I do not. You do I, not. Um, yeah, I, I have, I think, um, relative pitch. I'm usually about like a whole step or half step off. It depends on, it, it really depends on the day because I match it with my voice first, mm -hmm. uh, mentally. Then secondary, uh, I match it with clarinet. Because, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that tuning, the tuning is still in my head. You know, the, the B flat scale, re- mm -hmm every um band rehearsal it's always you know you, yeah 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 you know, and i'm curious now like is that even a b flat that that i sang and um was that it yeah so i'm a little sharp mm -hmm. yep that, that's that's ingrained and in, that's ingrained in my head <laughs> and um I, I try to reference off that I always use songs to reference. So if I want to see, I think of Eye of the Tiger because that's just C all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. And um I, I it, any for any moment at any time I try to pull from a song before before I, I reference a pitch. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. It's a good relative pitch. Mm -hmm. Uh what is this one's a bit this one's a bit deep, but uh this is our last one for, we'll take a quick section break. Uh, what is one of your favorite things about being a singer or just being a musician in general? The ability to communicate things that people wouldn't normally be able to do. So um, or for voice specifically, we have have that, that dynamic of being able to sing pitch, to sing dynamics, phrases, um, harmony or in being in harmony and then we have words as well um it's to, to, to me if the the music has to be able to communicate something even if it's something that's that's not comfortable in that moment mm -hmm. and so that i just feel like that's that's so that's something that at least for me that i always try to find whenever i sing a piece or whenever i talk about something if I'm listening to to music, like I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and they, they were were asking me if I had perfect pitch, and you know it's like so if I close this door, would you be able to tell the pitch? No, but I try to figure it out, and I try to I would try to figure out okay what is the material, what um, how loud was it, what was the rhythm, mm -hmm. uh, was it making just one screech or is it going you know was it doing all these different things? Yeah. Does it have a mu some musical idea to it? And you know, my brain automatically goes there because I, I'm always looking for for the way and how people communicate. So they may mm -hmm. say one thing, but what does what is what is their voice really saying? What is the tone of their voice, and what have they been through to be able to say it like this, or to have to say it like this? So all those things I, I'm always um, hyper aware of, which is also to my detriment in that. I can't focus if there's music playing <laughs> by any <laughs> means and I can't, I, the, the whole idea of, Oh yeah. You know, let's go ahead. Here's some study music for you. It's like, no, don't play study music because I will study the music <laughs> instead of my studies. <laughs> and so, um, but because that it's the, the music speaks to me, um, always like it's, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's always speaking to me somehow. It's all. It's awesome to be able to communicate 
more than what you're just just what you're saying mm. when you're playing when you're singing it's it's truly just an awesome experience it really really is that's one of my favorite things i know i know for a fact that was something that i don't remember who it was but someone else has definitely said that on one of my other podcasts well said Okie doke. So that brings us to the end of the traditional questions we have on here. So okay. this next little section will um, be an opportunity for you to um, kind of let the audience know what you got going on in your life. Anything coming up, any videos, advertise, etc. You have the floor for, next, for the next few minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, I think I do have a piece coming out. Um, I'm hoping mid February. Um, I usually don't get the opportunity to record as often as I as I want to, mm-hmm. and um, this this um, this month and next month has kind of opened up a little bit. So I think I'm going to go ahead and pursue this piece that I've been been thinking about, and it's uh, it. I'll go ahead and share share it with you right now. It is um, it's Rockman enough. Ooh, that's cool. I, I won't share. I, I won't share with you which piece. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully that would be that part of it would be the surprise. Yeah. Um, I I remember it la- last year. So yeah, I think last year, around this time, maybe March or April, did the uh, the Chesnikov, um Salvation is created, mm-hmm. and I, I decided to do that in English, then also um, Church Slavonic and the Alleluia section at the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, got some really good reviews on it, and so this this uh, piece. Um, maybe this time I won't wait a year. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll be able to do more than more than a couple. Uh, is um, is from Rachmaninoff, and uh, I've been been making sure like the text is is properly presented. Because you know, I uh, my um, Slavonic is not um, as great as I want it to be, but I also want to be able to study it and present it in such a way that. They do. If we do have native speakers or those who who understand it, I want them to be able to to glean from it, as opposed to it's like, oh, okay, the, he's making some really good sounds, but the words are incorrect. I, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember you were saying, um, you know, recording something and then not releasing it. I am. I I have mastered that. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have all these tracks and all these things, compositions and uh, arrangements, I've written. And they're on my computer, but I haven't released any of them because I just feel like, okay, I can do this now, or maybe I can do this to it, or maybe I shouldn't release this just yet. Yeah, yeah. For um, for everyone, yes, um, the the Rachmaninoff will be should be done by February, and I usually just try to release it as soon as it's done, and after you know, obviously some audio checks here and there. Exciting but, stuff. Yeah. Then in uh, March, I'll be. I'll be doing the actual Rachmaninoff <laughs> and uh, with with a professional ensemble in Arizona, so that's going to be fun. Some traveling. That'll be cool. Where at in Arizona? Uh, so this would be oh gosh, I, f- I forget where. It's, it's on the plane ticket, <laughs> so ah, okay. uh, yeah, I, I'd have to go back and, and check because once in a while I'll, I'll get like um, it's one uh, I've known for a couple of months now. Usually right around February, uh, I would I'll get a, like an email. It's like, hey, uh, we need you here in two weeks, and I just have to be ready. Mm-hmm. So, I this, gotcha. this one's gonna be this one's gonna be fun. I think uh, Tucson, I think uh, Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, 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 Tucson. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, in terms of collaborations, not not really much. Just mostly teaching. For the most part, I'll be I'll be doing that. And the YouTube videos, it seems like everyone everyone's been giving you giving me a a big demand on um some of the videos that have been happening here. So I'd like to be able to do that more as well. So it's I mean it's it's a you've got a good base too because you've got that you've got that that foundation of knowledge. It's 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 a complete fa- I, w- I won't say it's like an actual complete, but complete in comparison to some of us. Like for me, example, I have no like official music theory education, college, etc. But with that music teaching background you have, it's nice to know 
your insight on arrangements and music that's out there. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And um, I think Peter and I, we were talking one time, and he said something that I, I that I, I use all the time now, is that you, you should not forsake the visceral response of a person that makes, um, what, what I mean by that is person's authentic visceral response to music, whether they know the music or not, is just as meaningful, if not even more so, than someone who has the knowledge to say, hey, okay, this is the reason why we feel this way, because this chord was in this uh, arrangement, and it happened at this moment on this word. It's like, okay, that's all fun. At the same time, it's like, no, you know, what do you feel? And then yeah. for me, I try, I, I, I hope that's what I'm doing. Is like I try to bridge that gap. It's like, this is what I feel, and I'll let me articulate it, but I don't want to get into the articulation so much that now it sounds like I'm just preparing like some sort of musical sermon instead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can, but I, I mean, I save that for my, for the classroom, not for. <laughs> right. For like right. A, yeah. 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 That's definitely what my channel is kind of based around is just helping people understand the music and understand why they love it in comparison to just loving it. Exactly. it it's not only is it important to love the music that you love, but it's important to know why you love it. That's so true. Yep. So, um, if you are done with your little self promotion piece, we'll move on to the next piece where you have the floor to ask me any questions. Should you have any, so you have the floor for the next little bit for that as well. Um, <clears throat> it, um, do you be able to tell us what you have in store for, for, for your channel? Up? Ooh, yeah, this is some cool stuff. So, um, I typically, whenever I'm getting, bringing guests on, I, t I tend to try and normally I would like to be secretive, but given that I like to ask for, I like to ask my community for any questions to have that little bit, bit of extra, I guess you could say interaction between both myself, my community and the guest as well. I like to do, I like to announce who's coming on. So that way people can be like, Oh, maybe I can, um, get this question submitted. See if I can, um, ask them about this or oh, yeah. what do they think about subs or, um, what's their favorite food, you know, stuff like that. I just, I like oh, to have right. that extra little bit of, um, that extra little bit of uh, community interaction between the, the three of us. But as far as like who I'm having on the, the biggest ones here lately, or the biggest ones coming up right now, uh, being you right now, I, I've also had, I've got Bobby Waters coming on. Okay, yeah. Pretty big stuff. I've got yep. him coming uh, next Wednesday. Awesome. Yep. I'm looking at penciling in a day for Elliot Robinson to come on. So good. He's such a great guy. He really seems like yeah, it. Bo both of them are, yeah. I'm trying to get them down. Um, we're not able, or it's tentative for Elliot right now. Uh, Bobby is officially down. What do I have? I have my list right here, actually. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So I have... Just give away give away what you want to give away, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've got a few people I've reached out to, a couple of turndowns. Uh, mostly I haven't heard from a lot of people, but I've got... I've got some pretty cool stuff like in the form of Bobby coming on and Elliot um, trying to come on. I'm really, really, really trying to get Omar Cardona. It is so difficult to get a hold of him, but I am, I am trying. I did manage to get a hold of him one day on a, on a live. I, he did actually read multiple messages and he oh, yeah. said, yeah. he said, you know what? I've not heard of you before, but send me a DM with your info and we might be able to work something out. For unfortunately, oh, cool. he hasn't read that, but I've not lost hope. So yeah, yeah. there's still hoping, right? Yeah, but as far as exciting stuff coming coming down the pipe, I'd say that the podcast with Bobby next week and working on a day to get Elliot Robinson on are probably my biggest ones at the moment. I'm trying to get a hold of the Newfangled Four, but that's also proving okay. difficult. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much what's coming down the pipeline at the moment. That's so cool. I got to 
got a chance to to hang out with Bob. Well, of course, you know, <laughs> hang out with him twice, uh, just just like back to back. Yeah, and uh, such a great guy, R- really, really great, very musical, very, very down to earth. So, um, I think Kel- Kelly and I may uh, maybe might we might try to make another visit out there some, sometime soon. So we'll see what happens. Bobby's an interesting fella. Yeah. I've not had the fortune. Uh, what's the word? I have not had the pleasure of speaking to him directly yet, but hopefully we'll have that changed next week. Dude's got a monstrous C2. I have to say. Oh yeah. Yep. Monstrous yep. C2. It's amazing. Yep. But that's pretty much the extent of what I've got going on at the moment. That's exciting for the channel. Anyway, it's coming down. Okay. All right. Anything else sticking out that you, uh, anything burning that you want to ask? No, uh, I think I, I saw, well, I, I did see you uh, posting, um, was it a demo or like a preview of your, uh, of you and, um, who was it? Was it Fernie? Yes, that's him. Okay. Yeah. He's, so um, I'm... this project, I will, re- I will, uh, very briefly, very briefly reveal a little bit of info on. So this was my first attempt at anything recorded professionally. And this was my first my confidence building piece. So this was this thing that I was, okay, I'm going to get a makeshift studio. I'm, I'm, I have the rest of the equipment. Right. I'm just going to jump in the studio. I'm going to warm up. I'm going to record all this stuff. I'm not going to listen back to it. I'm just going to send it, send it off to someone that can mix it, make it sound good. And when I got this back, I like, it blew my socks off. Like I did not know I could sound like that. Yeah. And it's, I will give away who's doing or the name of the artist for the song. It is an imagined dragon song that we are doing a short cover of. Okay. And it, re- it releases this coming Monday. Um, and I carry the lead and the higher harmonies while uh, Fernie carries the low range. And um, there, there's a couple of uh, nice, nice extended low notes in there. Um, All right, looking forward to it. <laughs> he's got, he's got a nice. Uh, I'm, I, I don't want to reveal too much, but there's right. a couple of really, really sweet extended technique low notes in there. But from him, both him and me, so good. It's really cool, exciting stuff. And if people want to hear a full cover of this. We already talked over the possibility of doing the rest of the song. So if people right. like it enough, we'll do we'll release the short version and we'll do a full version. So cool, cool. Looking forward to it. Man, I'm excited. It'll be cool to hear what some other people think of it too, because like this is my yeah. first step into the recording world. Like mm-hmm. I it I don't know, but it'd be really cool to see like what somebody else has to say about it that like knows a lot about music. I, then it would be totally different because people I react to people's videos and it'd be interesting for people to react to mine. I'm like, I won't know what to do with myself other than smile, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, but that's pretty much what I've got going on with him and we're going to be doing more stuff in the future, guys. Stay tuned. Stuff. But yeah, that's what I've got going on at the moment. <laughs> Uh, so if you've not got any further questions for me, we will go ahead and migrate over to the community submitted questions. Sure, so sure, these are, ahead. these are submitted to us via YouTube, Instagram, and several discord servers, including the base nation as well. Okay. So this first question will be, uh, from Baseman Mateo, in case you know him, um, were you always good at subharmonics or did it take a while for you to learn them? It, um, the learning curve, I picked it up pretty easy in terms of like being it to where it is now today. It took a really long time. It's right around the time when, when I learned it, it was, there wasn't really any, like really anybody talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, a lot of it was just, okay, conjecture. It feels like this. This is what it feels like. Maybe if I do this and maybe if this works, so a lot of, if this, then this, if not, then this going on. Um, 
Yeah, I would say my first attempt at it would have been this would be 2000 and I want to say 2007, 2008. I first really? uh, so when I first attempted it and it was after hearing uh, of Vladimir Pasukov um getting down to like a, a G sharp 1 and I'm like this is insane. How how are you doing this? And so I tried i tried i tried and to no avail i just couldn't do it then my voice just broke like it just kind of like i was so tired and my voice kind of broke into the subharmonic mm -hmm. wait a minute it sounds kind of like it i think i, I think i think i'm onto something <clears throat> yeah and so i i picked it up there and i stopped for a little while and then jumped back jumped back on like about 2009 i really started um choir directors started asking me to hey um Oh, you have this low C, but can you give me a little bit more? I say, mm -hmm. oh, sure, yeah, I can give you a little more. Then I was able to switch uh, to subharmonics, and they're like, yeah, that that's we, that's how much we want. Like, don't don't give any more than that. <laughs> that's awesome. And, um, so, and they started asking for B flats and A's and A flats, and I just kept on working. So, um, a, a lot of my experience was actually, um, oral subharmonic experience as opposed to like okay record myself on mic and then okay. show it to everybody it was mostly like in in the ensemble mm -hmm. it wasn't until like 2013 i actually started my own channel and decided maybe i should talk about this a little bit and see if anyone else catches it and sure enough someone did and the rest is history from there <laughs> yeah and it, it, you were among the first to really truly bring it to light at least in the youtube space yeah, and it, it happened over Facebook on the, the base forum. It started there, and there were some people that were also talking about extended techniques at the mm -hmm. time. And they, they coined it, they, they found the term subharmonics, which um, came from, from the studies back in like the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like different vocal techniques and vocal faults and um, people with, with a, like vocal paralysis and what they sound like. Mm -hmm. so, so the, that's kind of where it came from, and um, from there it just it just took off, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and it and it's it's done well so far, it seems. And how long you said it took you a while? Um, it took you a while to learn it, but how long in the context of how long it actually took you? Like how long did it like take you? I guess you could say in learning it, going from being a noob to your current level. Oh, um. I I can't answer that for sure. I think when I started using it a little bit more in my performances, so this would have been 2012. So this is after I graduated and started just started teaching. That's when, when I started using a little bit more because I was performing a little more too. Mm -hmm. And so um, off and on 2008, 2009 really jumped in 2010 like trying to figure it out it took me a couple of years to, to get to where to where i felt comfortable performing where i am now um i all i can say is that's how long it took all from 2008 all the way till now <laughs> i was just curious because uh, that's yeah. um I'm, I'm still learning it and i'm just like how long do i have to or how long can i expect to spend before it sounds halfway decent <laughs> but yeah I, I will say for for me it did sound halfway decent after about a couple of weeks but it was pretty unstable yeah um, it was it was just trying to find fine tune it then after about like a couple of months i got a little bit better but the, at that point i was thinking is this bad for my voice what can i do mm -hmm. so um a lot of if you if you notice just a lot of what where my approaches were was simply to find okay is this viable is it healthy and how long can be used. And so far there's I've experienced no no vocal health issues. Awesome. So, I remember I'm doing, I'm, hopefully I'm doing something right. <laughs> I, so, hopefully we're all doing something right. Right, right. But um I remember whenever I first picked up subs, I was sitting there twiddling around with it. I was literally I had just gotten off the clock from working at home and I was I was just like how can I do this? I was like, hmm, hmm. and I was just sitting there playing with it and I couldn't ever figure it out, but I've 
I'd slip into it, then I'd slip out. And then it took me a few weeks, but I figured it out. Fast forward to about two to three weeks ago. I had by far the longest and juiciest uh, sub I had ever done, which was a C sharp D flat one. I held it for nine seconds straight and I was just, I was clicking my heels happy. Like I didn't think I would ever get that good of a sounding sub in comparison to when I first started. That's awesome. I was trying to get an idea how long it would truly take me to like get good at it. Um, it, Yeah. It all depends on the person. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, This one's uh, from um, element of surprise. Uh, favorite beverage that's not water. So you, you we already answered that. You said you like root beer. Um, root beer. Is there any others that stick out to you? Like, um, you, you know, I. What is that a drink? Recently, I've had this. It's like um, gave cream soda. Uh, that I really oh, like. Cream soda. Yeah. I, so it's like um, instead of sugar, they use uh, agave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From yeah. the plant. And so um, that's, I don't know what it is, but it's pretty amazing. So I'm, For me, I'm probably sticking with mostly cream sodas and <laughs> root beer, sarsaparilla. Yeah. I've never that's... known much about cream sodas or anything like that. I remember be I remember trying root beer that one time and never wanting to try it again. <laughs> Because it's got that, the way I describe it to people is that it's mm-hmm. liquid candy hearts. Pretty much, yep. <laughs> oh, I feel bad describing it that way. I'm going to get some hate in the <laughs> comments. Oh, no, no, they, they shouldn't because that's, I mean, it, it, there, there are obviously different ones that taste different, but, you know, that's licorice pretty much. You know? Oh, my gosh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, this next one is from is also from uh, Mateo. Uh, have you ever can used? Have you ever considered using Ingressive Phonation, uh, singing in songs? And he said he's heard you use it in a live stream once, but not in an actual like a recording setting. And he also mentioned that you were really good at it. And this is being someone that apparently does it on a regular basis. Yeah. Um. So for me, I typically use it to just regulate my voice. Um. I have used it. Have I done it live? May have. Would have been many, many years ago with my acapella group in college. Um, I think it was like a... Pretty sure I used it for like a, a D1 or something. And uh, it, it was pretty easy on, on the voice. I was like, no, I, I, we need a little bit more, more bass. And I'm pretty tired. And it's toward the end of the show. Sure, I'll just... I'll just breathe in the note is what I called it. <laughs> <laughs> breathe in the note. Breathe in. The before note. I figured out it was uh, ingressive. But, um, I've thought about it. Typically, since I'm usually doing choral things, I haven't incorporated that. Like w- whenever I sing, if if I'm doing like a multi-track choir thing, I try to stick with a range that I would be able to perform live with. I t- I won't go down below uh, E1 is probably the lowest I'll, I'll ever go. Yeah. Um, ingressive. I I've considered it. For for other things, maybe maybe um, maybe like a a more contemporary song, in the near future. Yeah, 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 for sure. I'm exploring the uses of it myself in the in the recording studio. Um, this one also comes from Element of Surprise. Uh, okay. I cu- I couldn't help but to chuckle when I read this one. He said, "Are baritones just lazy tenors?" <laughs> oh, bar- baritones are. They they are the heroic um, voice of the of the male voice section. There's there's nothing like a good baritone. I mean, because if you if you are if you are balanced in your sound, you can sound like a bass and you can sound like a tenor. That's that's the part that that really gets me because there are some bass baritones that have this amazing high range. I'm like, oh come on now, you're singing a high B almost like a tenor <laughs> and you might as well yeah and you, and you can pull it off so well and i'm over here you know i'm, I'm like i'm over here textbook lyric bass 
that's me. Open the textbook in that range, in opera setting, that sound, that lyricism. That's where that's like that's, that's about where I am, <laughs> and I, I don't go above that. I may maybe I go below that a little bit here and there, but um, yeah. <laughs> I fit but, I fit that direction or that that description of a baritone somewhat well it seems, albeit a lower lying baritone. But yes, mm. it's uh, hilarious like how good like a baritone is at just about anything. Like I'm not to, I'm not doting on myself, but I I will I will say um uh, that I out of out of the baritone sound I do prefer the bass baritone. And I'm not, not, I'm not biased by any means. It's just like something that I've been drawn to mm-hmm. is that for some reason they, they have, when they sing in their lower range and typically the bass baritone, when the baritone rows, rolls are a little bit lower, so the bass baritone has a little bit more heft in those notes, Vincently or that, of that sound. Um, then now you, some of your bass baritones can also, ha- they also have that upper re- release to like an A flat four, so they can sing just as high as the regular baritones. And they have the low range and the warmth, and so it's like, well, who's going to be on the stage every night? You know, it's your it's your bass baritone. <laughs> if I if I sang opera, I, I think I would probably fit in that description. I guess. Yeah. yeah I, so it's. I apparently have that kind of range. I have some... apparently so. Last time I remember, like measuring my usable daily chest range usable is c sharp d flat to to a b4 okay uh i remember i can get my c can't i can't talk i can get a c5 about half the time about probably three four days out of the week i'd say but if my voice is gassed the lowest i can go is like i'd say like a d2 but see good it's pretty crazy i didn't realize like how capable my voice can be sometimes i was Uh, crying because i was like i want to be a bass Uh." oh yeah i was that wannabe bass singer (laughs) let's see i gotta go to another tab for this one let's see um this one comes from bass crispies he says Uh, you've had the opportunity to rub shoulders with some of the greatest octav- octavists and bass singers of our time. Speaking of technique very broadly, who are some of the most technically apt basses in the business today? I'd have to say Glenn Miller. It's just, it's there, it's all the time. And it's not, it's not like it's just loud. It's technically sound as well. And it's, it's what you would want, what you would want from, from an instrument. If, if you have a tuba section, don't want your tuba to start sounding softer and thinner as it goes down into that lower range. Right, mm-hmm. the tuba goes down to like a D one. I think. I mean, you can go lower, obviously. Mm-hmm. D one in terms of of where of where it is, it just sounds massive and so warm. Yeah, but at the same time, it could still be just as lyrical. And when when I when I listen to Glenn, I, I hear I hear all of that. I can hear like the technique. Oh, this is what it means by staying open. This is what it means. This is what he means when he says you don't press down on your voice, because that's what he does. He doesn't do that. He just sings it. He just lets the air goes through, the vocal folds move, and the sound happens. I mean, he's he's, done. and it's not like he's pushing for it either. No, um, I've, I've never, I haven't heard him push any of the notes, even on the low F that he had, F one live in concert. Which might be might have been touching E one depending on which performance we were talking about. Yeah, and he's there. He's just there all the time. So, uh, yeah, I I would say technically sound, it's right there, and of course right right next to him is uh, Eric Alatori in terms of the, in terms of just like. The the line of sound note to note, it's just wow! It's so consistent. Um, in terms of volume, I feel like. You know, Glenn has has more of that dramatic, uh, profundo sound, whereas Eric has a, like a more lyric approach to it. And it's mm-hmm. not. I'm not trying to say that one is a lyric profundo and one is a dramatic profundo. We can we, we'll leave that to the, um, the the vocal coaches and and the other people. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is that when I hear Eric's voice, I just hear like contrabass, uh, mm-hmm. as a, 
and when I hear uh, Glenn's voice, I hear like a bass trombone, or tuba, it's more like more brass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. what you mean. At the same time, they can both be lyrical and also dramatic in their own sense. Sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, this one comes from Jerome. Uh, what are some of your favorite songs that you have performed, and why did you choose them? If you had the cho- chance to choose them. <laughs> The songs that I perform, um, is this just, just a follow up question. Is this solo or is this just general? Just in general. Or <clears throat> anything. Um, for, for me, it has to be the, the Rachmaninoff. There's just something about it. It's, it's like a marathon. It's like you're running a marathon, you're not just, you're not just singing a song on stage and you're, you're off mic in the choir. You have to support the choir and you have to do it like three, at least three, three or four times during performance, and then three or four times for rehearsal. Like, I mean, being when I get fl- flown in for a rehearsal or performance, typically what happens, and the endurance of it, it's it's exhilarating for me to to have to to be able to do it, get to do it. So for me, it's it's always going to be the the rock on off, mostly because I get I get to do it a lot throughout the year, mm-hmm. but um. Also because it really challenges me every time I, I perform it because there are some moments where I'm like, oh, do I have a B-flat one subs right now? <laughs> or if, is it going to fizzle out, right? Right, yeah. Then do I have a G? Do I have a G1 subs? Uh, is, is the director going to ask me to sing a G1? <laughs> and one of the directors did. And it's like, I know it's not written in there, but I'd like for you to put it in there. And I'm like, okay, I'll... I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and we're not talking about a G1 like that's close to the mic. We're talking about, it's like, I want you to balance the choir, but I also don't want you to be, to rattle. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. want you to like sizzle through. I want you to just be warm and support the choir. So like, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be my piece. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Um, this one's kind of already been asked, but um, this I think this one's asking a slightly different way. Uh, this one comes from Crucio. So he says, um, how did you find out about subharmonics? And you kind of told us about how you learned it, so we'll leave that part off. But um, how did you find out about them? Um, pretty much just started researching it. Uh, besides finding it out for myself vocally, once I understood what the term was referring to, um, there was a video that I saw from Mari Kimura. I believe that's how you pronounce it. She did some violin sub- subharmonics. And uh, she, she was um, a, a huge proponent of extended techniques on the string the string instruments. That's so cool. I saw her video and I saw what she was doing. And I'm like, that's the sound. That's That sounds almost like what my voice is doing. And it didn't sound like it was a... a it didn't sound like it was combining two tones at once or two strings at once. It mm-hmm. sounded like it was just my voice, but there's some there's another element that's occurring. So um, to technically answer the question, that's right around the time when I, I found out, around 2013, when the term was being introduced. And it's like, okay, this is what I've been doing. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Makes sense. <clears throat> this one comes from Basie Banana. Um, so, well... That's kind of already been answered. Uh, he said, or this is set like a three-part question. Second part is, um, how do you create such power with your low notes? I, what I do is I make sure my the imprint of my voice isn't so drastically changed. If I'm singing, so I'm not, I'm not also forcing my voice out. So if I'm singing a certain note, I want it to ring out, I keep... I try to make sure I'm not hearing my own voice within my own head. I guess you could say I I, I feel it as if uh, I, I'm just singing a normal note. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm singing. In, let's see, I don't know where my voice is right now. So let's see. <coughs> so G sharp three. So. so when I'm singing that, I'm not worried about. Only thing I'm concerned about is is their vocal freedom and is everything aligned up. If it is, it's going to cut through. I feel like my experience, I, I've done it enough to where I can feel where 
tipping point is. Mm -hmm. So uh, when in terms of developing power, mostly just developing the overtones and the fundamental itself, we're trying to give as much beef I can that fundamental so that and the, the fifth that when it does interact or when it does do its we'll call it subharmonic magic if you want to get call it that <laughs> um i just trust that it works yeah. at that point so um, i'm not pushing my voice beyond be, to be louder than everyone else but i'm finding that place of freedom and i just allow it to bring out like for now like that that a that g sharp three the the piece that i did with um St. Tikon Choir back in um <clears throat> this this would have been like a last last year. Um he had me go down to an A flat one. It was just me o over the choir. So I just went for it and I don't know how loud he wanted it, so I just kept the air moving and went it came out just fine. So yeah, um so focus on the overtones. That's how I get it get it going. It's just focus on the top end worry about the fundamental because the fundamental will be in those moments gotcha gotcha focus on the overtones and the fundamental mm -hmm. oh um i believe that wraps up all of the community related questions at this point in time so that will okay. bring us to the last little section where we have anything that we have that we would like to say we have the time to do so now before we wrap things up so now that we, we say our pieces and then we wrap her up. Okay. Well, um, you know, Drew, I really, really appreciate this. Um, you invited me to do this. It's uh, it's always a privilege to, to talk to uh, any, any of the, um, the BSN, um, uh, members, any, like really anybody that's interested in the bass voice. It's always, it's almost like it's so there are sub communities that are you know not literally sub communities but mm -hmm. uh, i mean like um smaller communities within yeah and it's almost like we all just kind of know each other or we know by name mm -hmm. um, like oh yeah Bo bobby bobby base yeah do you know who he is uh, of course yeah I, I know him yeah and you know i, I have people uh you know friends here in the city is like you know bobby base and it's like oh well, um yeah i I do. It's like, yeah, I didn't, I had no idea. I saw his video and then I saw that you were on it. And I saw that, you know, and it's just so, it's such a blessing because I feel like pretty much, uh, I'm, I'm, I may be speaking for myself, but I, I feel that every, every member um, of this community is very supportive. Oh, yeah. And it's just, it's so, they're so kind or, toward the um, the music that's occurring and toward the toward the bass voice oh 100 percent, yeah and so that's that's always nice because you go anywhere else and then they're like bass what oh yeah <laughs> you have such a great baritone voice you know what baritone voice do you sing and that's a pretty deep baritone voice and i'm like do, do you understand that baritones and basses are both low voices but there mm -hmm. there's there's a distinction <clears throat> yes and um even in the the music today, it's kind of like, oh, you know, when you hear a really good bass voice, you kind of want to tune in. To it. And I, I think I'm just all tendered tendered out with um, <laughs> pop music. Love yeah, to, yeah. I love the tenor voice. Like, don't get me wrong. It's unfortunate that the pop music uh, is is not fully representing. Like, show us some some baritones or so, show us some tenors digging into like a G two. Yeah, a tenor singing. A tenor singing a G two can be really, really good. They have it, <laughs> especially um, if it's like well placed, well timed. Oh yeah. it, sound, it sounds full. All, all, uh, sound, I, I would even venture to say that if it's placed really well, it might sound will sound darker than a baritone because it's at the end of the range. Yeah, just like like me, you know, my C four is almost at the end of my range, mm -hmm. so a tenor C four is not going to sound the same. Mm. And it's. Just, so it's just it's just where we live and it's it's great mm -hmm. to to do that so uh, uh once again thank you so much for for doing these uh, i'm enjoying them i'm i'm trying to get time to watch uh from episode 1 too i think i i think i'm on episode 3 right now oh yeah. yeah the first one was casper second one was yeah. lizzie Garozzo, and the third was marwan peter uh, fourth one was marwan 
Oh, oh that Marwin. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. yeah. That's right. I mean, it's cool to know that you're watching them too. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah, yeah. And so is... I... I that's just me. So, <laughs> <laughs> guys, it's been a pleasure having uh, two on here with us today, geeking out over music and such. We learned a lot about them today. If you like the content, you're new to the channel, click the like and the subscribe button. And if you're looking to take your contribution to the channel to a new level, I now have a Patreon you, where you can support me as little as three dollars a month if you so choose to. And um, also, I will drop all of Two's information in the description, so that way you can go check him out and his work. He is phenomenally talented. He's a great music teacher. So if you want to learn a lot about the voice and music in general, he's a very good source of information. So thank you. I, it's been it's been a pleasure having you. We're gonna wrap this podcast up, guys. This is Drew on the Vocast. Love you. Take care of yourselves. We will see you in the next one. Bye.